Hi everybody, good evening from Ireland and you're very welcome to this third session in the Wet Felt Meets Eco Printing Bootcamp. I'm thrilled to see so many of you are here on time and it's lovely to see people coming in from all different parts of the world. So in case this is your first evening tuning in, who am I and where do I live? So my name is Nicola Brown. I'm a textile artist living and working in rural Ireland. And I'm passionate about sharing wet felting and eco printing tips and techniques. And I also am passionate about growing my own vegetation for using in my studio, both for eco printing and for natural dyeing. So please feel free to say hi to everybody else drop a comment in the chat facility, let us know where you're coming from. And as I say, this is day three of a boot camp, all about eco printing and wet felting. So today, our focus for this third day is all about sculptural felt. Now, I know that some of you are experienced felt makers, some of you are experienced eco printers, but some of you may never have experimented with either technique before. So it's very important for me to strip things back to the basics. And today I'm just going to chat about how I like to create sculptural felt. There obviously are many different ways of doing this, but how I like to create um, three-dimensional pieces. And I'll give you tips that I find handy myself in my studio. And then towards the end of the live stream, I will be extremely happy to answer your questions. So please feel free to drop questions in the comment section. And my friend Sock is going to moderate the comments. So when you add, ask a question, it's actually helpful if you put three question marks at the beginning and the end. He can see it better and he will queue up your questions for me. So I suppose the first question to ask is what exactly is three-dimensional or sculptural felting? So up until now, um, I've more or less discussed two-dimensional felting or flat felting. So that's where you would lay several different layers of fiber and you would massage and work that fiber together to form non-woven fabric. But sculptural felting or three-dimensional felting, that's actually created around something called a resist. And the resist tends to be a plastic template the felt is started flat and then subsequently as you work the piece it ends up becoming three-dimensional so the easiest way of explaining that that i find works for me if i'm trying to get my head around what sculptural felt is when i'm laying it out if you think of an envelope with a letter inside if you think of your wool fiber as the envelope and if you think of your resist material, your template in the middle, the plastic or whatever you choose to use in the middle, if you think of that as the letter. So the letter is the resist material and the felt fiber is the envelope. And for me, that is the easiest way of thinking about sculptural felt, about how I would go about creating it. But there are all sorts of different sculptural felt pieces. I'm going to share quite a few images of making a felt bag and eco printing the bag. So you can see a piece from the beginning to the end. But I'm just going to hold this up here. This is a felt bangle. So this also was felted on a resist. So I actually have a very simple YouTube video. So this would have been felted over a long rectangular resist. And then I would have taken the resist out as the felt was coming together and made it three dimensional. I also have a tutorial on YouTube about felting cords. And um, this here, this particular one, I've used this as a necklace. And this is also three dimensional. It's felted in a slightly different way, but there's a tutorial for that on my YouTube channel. and. 
in the um, bag that I'm going to share images of when I made the bag, I made two felt cords like this and I eco printed them and they became the handles of the simple felt bag. So, um, so the first thing to say is, um, if you're making something like a bag or a hat or maybe a dress, the method is really identical. It just depends how, how many layers of fiber you choose to use for your piece. So if I'm making a sculptural um, vessel, such as this one here, this particular piece has three layers of fiber. And in this case, I use three layers of merino. However, if I was making a much larger vessel, that particular one is approximately 24 centimeters um, in diameter. So that's about a foot in diameter. If I was making a larger vessel, I would definitely choose to use another layer or two of fiber because more layers of fiber will make it um, that bit more robust so you would choose your fiber depending on what you are actually making so um the resist so what exactly is a resist so the resist is what you have in the middle think of it like the letter and my favorite material to use is something called laminate floor underlay so this is something you would get in the hardware store. And if you were laying down a new laminate floor, this is a sort of a squishy material that goes underneath the wood, the laminate floor, and it insulates and it um, is a protective sort of layer under the wood. It's an underlay. So I actually have a little video to share in just one minute with you of how I would cut out the template for a piece. So you've got to think about your wet felting process. So with wet felting, you are shrinking the fibers so that they form a cohesive piece. So when you are laying out a sculptural piece, I'm just going to use the bag as an example. You need to make sure that you shrink your piece sufficiently and fully so that the bag is totally usable. It's got no weak spots and it's very firm. And I like to do a lot of rubbing on my piece when I have the fibers laid around the template before I ever move on to the rolling process. Those of you who are new to wet felting, I encourage you to start with a two dimensional or a flat felt piece and to check out my full step-by-step -step tutorial on YouTube. Because if you haven't felt it before, it would be easier to felt a flat felt piece before you attempt something sculptural. But once you have the fibers laid out around your resist, you've got to, to work out how much they're going to shrink. Now, I may have said to you before at the beginning of this boot camp, maybe in session one, I work in more of an intuitive way, but that doesn't mean that I don't want my pieces to look good and to stand the test of time. And I don't know roughly how much fiber I need to use myself, but I'm not going to be giving you any recommended quantities because each person lays their fiber out thicker or thinner. But I just want you to understand that that you, your piece is going to shrink. So whatever size you cut out your template, allow for at least 33% shrinkage. So 33% shrinkage. So I will just think of the shape I want, and then I will cut my template out. So um, that's what I do. And I love to use the laminate floor underlay for the resist. So I'm actually going to just play a short video. So you can see this particular um, laminate underlay and you can see me cutting out um, the bag template. But also when you see this, if you're not familiar with it, sometimes when you would buy something like a washing machine or a large electrical item, it could come wrapped in this sort of material. And I know in America, you can get similar things like this material in 
places like maybe UPS or somewhere that's going to do package things to send them abroad. So you can use different things for your resist, but I find that this is the best. So I'm just going to share an actual video now of me cutting out a template, just so you can see how I cut the bag template. And then I'll move on to the process for making the actual bag. So here goes, and I hope you can hear this. I'm going to see in one minute. I put aside the waste material. Uh, okay. I like to cut all my resists freehand with a sharp pair of scissors and I'm using two millimeter thick laminate floor underlay to create this template or resist for a bag. This is also the same method if I was creating a felt pod or some other sculptural felt. So I fold the template material, the laminate underlay in half, and then I make my first cuts. So I'm aiming to get the shape of the bag at the beginning, but this will need to be adjusted possibly, as you're going to see in one minute. I put aside the waste material and this template here I feel is too broad and there's also a sort of a sharp corner and it's not as straight as I would like at the bottom edge. So what I now do is I'll fold it in half again and I'll just trim it down. Of course you can draw your template out on paper and cut it out first and then just a little bit like cutting out a pattern in cloth you could put your paper down and you could cut around that that would be more accurate but this is how i like to do mine and i don't want to get hung up on things now i feel that this shape is more pleasing for the bag that i am intending to make the handles will be at the narrower top end and it just needs a small bit of trimming at the very bottom edge but i can roll it up the other direction to get it flatter i can have a good look at it so I'm just going to trim here, get that straighter, and then have a look at the bottom. And in fact, I'm quite happy with the bottom. So there is my template all ready to go. So that was me cutting out my template from the laminate floor underlay. And Pam has a very good question here. Um, so do you cut your template size that you want to end up with or the size before shrinkage? Always before shrinkage, Pam, because if you cut your template the size you want your bag to be, and then you felt your bag, it's going to end up uh, at least a third smaller. So you cut your template. Let's see, I just do it intuitively and I eye it up. But let's just say um, this is the size you want to end up with. You need to make it one third bigger all around for whatever your piece would be. Um, so that is really important to know. So you make it the size that you want the piece to be plus a third. But don't stress about it too much at the beginning. Uh, and it's always easier to work on a slightly larger template rather than a smaller one. And it's important, I wouldn't like to work on this with the um, sharp corners. I would curve all the corners. And the reason for that is it's much easier to wrap your fiber around the edge of your template if there's a little curve. So, um, that's that. I'm going to start sharing some images of me laying out a piece now. And I do see there are questions coming in that are about um, wet felting as well. We'll discuss wet felt or about eco printing. We'll discuss the eco printing and I'll answer those questions once I get to the eco printing stage. But if you could just um, <laughs> reserve those questions until later and the questions I would prefer right now is about the the sculptural felt and the creation of it so I'm going to add these to the stream here now so this is a sculptural piece and the template for this piece was just a round circle so it was totally round and Think of the template like the letter and the felt like the envelope. So 
when I actually was creating this piece, it was flat on the table. They obviously don't start off three-dimensionally. They start off flat. And so what you actually do at the very beginning is, I have got my bag template actually on my table. On top of my bag template, I have my bubble wrap with the bubbles facing up. And I can see through the bubble wrap where the edge of the template is. And I'm radiating one fine layer of fibers just around the edge of the template so that the tips are going to be going over the edge of that template. So I lay a very, very fine layer of fibers around. And then when I've done that, I lay one layer of fiber in a vertical layer. So I just go over the whole of the bag template in a vertical layer. And that's really important. And I don't go out over the edge of the template. I go up to the edge of the template. And those little fibers that are going over, they're the ones that are going to end up going over to the other side to form side two, to form the edge of side two. So once I have side one laid out, I will wet it. I'll put my net on and I'll add my soap exactly as if I was doing a piece of flat felt. And then what I will do is I will take that template, that plastic laminate under underlay from under the bubble wrap. I'll put it on top of my wet felt and then I will pull those little fibers at the edge up tightly around the resist. And then I will repeat the very same process on this side. So I will radiate fibers around the outside and I will lay all the fibers on the infill vertically. So does everybody understand that? If you don't understand that, I think now is the time for, <laughs> for actually asking a question. So um, yes, Nicola, so everything. So I'm actually sharing some of these images. This is actually from a series of videos I did for a wet felt bag online workshop last year. And I just took some screenshots today so you could see how this particular bag was formed. It started flat and then it is three dimensional at the end. And actually, I'm going to be adding in some of these previous um, step by step video tutorials that I haven't shared on Facebook, they will all be heading for the new membership platform, so that there's a library of content for people to to work through at the beginning. So this is um, a, this is a bag I'm laying out and it started flat. So um, it started flat. And now I, I in fill on this side. And then I will wet, I will net, and I will soak the piece on this side. And that completes one full layer of fiber. So this is something that is really, really important. So I'm actually going to just take an envelope here. This actually has a letter in it. So think of the letter inside like the plastic. So I have the wool on one side or here and I fold the little edges over and then I, I complete the layer by putting wool on this side. So two sides complete one full layer. And that's really important to know because if you're actually doing a bag or a vessel with three layers of wool, there are actually six sides that you need to cover. So that's just an important point to note. So. I'm just going to go back. So to make a three dimensional piece, you cut the shape of your template one third bigger than your finished, the size you want your finished piece. You radiate fibers around the outside. You infill them in a vertical direction and then you wet, net and soap. You have the template then on top, you pull those fibers in nice and tightly around the template and you repeat on that side there. So, oh dear, don't tell me I am missing one. 
Okay, I, I did have a few a few technical issues early on, so I may not have the next set of slides. So what happens then is you repeat the process, but on the second layer, full layer, instead of putting the fibers vertically, you put them horizontally. So you go around the outside and then you infill in the opposite direction or the, the cross to the first side and the first layer and you do that and then you wet it and you net it and you pull the edges in and you do the same for the third layer the third layer the fibers all go vertically again so by the end of that time what you will actually have is you will then have a piece your package will be all laid out and you then start the actual felting process so when you are doing the um the felting process it's the same as when you're felting um a flat felt there's rubbing there's rolling but you just keep rotating your package and you keep changing direction of where you're rubbing and rolling now i am going to put a basic tutorial on youtube for wet felting a vessel but that's not really what this um boot camp is about the boot camp is discussing about making them giving you a few tips and then discussing about eco printing them and answering your questions rather than a full step-by-step -step tutorial i honestly think you need to see it all from start to finish like my flat felting tutorial just to understand it totally but as i said um when you have your piece made then you can make some cords for your handle and i have a full tutorial for that already up on youtube and by that stage what you end up with is you end up with um your bag with an opening at the top because i cut into the felt to remove that plastic template once i was sure everything was holding together and then i continued to shrink it until there was no more um stretch available so lexi has a question here and she's saying how am i testing my felt to know it is fully felted to be honest lexi when there is no more stretch whatsoever in it i keep working it until i can't stretch it any further and i'm sorry that i don't appear to have the final images of the actual felting process as i say i had a few tech issues it's not an excuse but it is a reason and i thought they had uploaded and they hadn't so i'm just going to continue with this and i will answer your questions afterwards so you can take it that this bag that i have felted was in a three-dimensional shape and before I eco print, whether it's a hat, a bag, or whether it is um, a bracelet like this, I would flatten the piece totally flat for the eco printing stage. So this bag had been sitting up on its bottom and I then flattened it back down. And you can see here that this piece has been sprinkled with vinegar. You can see it's a little bit sort of brown looking. And if you um, remember from the first video and also the second video, I said if you had created your felt, you could move straight on to the eco printing process without ever drying your felt. But if your felt had actually been dried first, you would need to soak it at least overnight in warm water so that it would absorb water. And in that way, it's going to be more receptive to absorbing the natural dye color when you eco print it. So this piece would have had the excess water squeezed out and then it was sprinkled with vinegar. So, um, ah, honestly, I, I'm losing the plot. Apologies. I do have these slides here. So let's go backwards. So here I just was repeating laying out the, um, the bag. So you can see it, it's got the wool now on both sides of the template. Here I am cutting into it once I'm sure it's all starting to shrink. I'm cutting into it to make the opening at the top of the bag. 
Uh, I should add that the opening will always stretch. So it's really important when you cut an opening to make sure to seal the edges of your felt well so that it doesn't stretch too much. If you make your opening too big, you can't make it smaller. If you make it too small, <laughs> you can make it bigger. So I just think it's important to say, don't make any opening too big. Make sure it's not too large and then you can make it smaller again afterwards. And here you can see I was shaping the bag a bit. You can see that it's holding its shape. It's had all the soap washed out of it at this stage, totally washed out of it. And then I moved on and I flattened it. And you can see I also have my two handles there. So um, that's ready to lay the vegetation out. Now, felt is really interesting if it's a heavier sculptural piece because you can choose to use a rusty metal pipe or a copper pipe to roll up on. But if you don't have a pipe or if you want to, the felt is very substantial and it's very easy to roll it up on itself. So that's exactly what I did for this particular bag because I also wanted to demonstrate to people who are participating in this specific online workshop. I wanted to demonstrate that you could um, that you could lay it out and roll it out with uh, roll it up without having to use a pipe. Um, so I see a few more questions um, about the, the felting process. Claude, one layer of one layer, one side of fiber on uh, one layer of fiber on one side of the template, the edges go over and then you need to finish that layer on the other side and you repeat that twice more. So you end up with three layers of fiber ultimately. Um, <laughs> Wendy, with the flipping over part, um, what you have to do is you have to, um, you, you have to, have it flat on the table as it looks like in this image here. And instead of me about to put some more wool on this, I would just put my second piece of bubble wrap on top of that and I would turn the whole package over exactly the same way as I would if I was turning over a piece of flat felt. But you need to be a bit more careful and you need to grab hold of the piece. Um, so um, one more question here about the resist. The resist is all a sort of a foam. There was a silver layer on mine and that's just an insulating thing. So it just um, can be reused multiple, multiple, multiple times. And we have another question here. Um, so once you turn it over, um, Sophie, from one side to the other, you just repeat. If you lay them vertically on side one, you lay them vertically on side two. Then you turn it back to side one and you lay them horizontally. You keep laying them at right angles to each other and you keep folding in at the edge. I am going to put a full tutorial for this on YouTube, but it won't be for another few weeks. And so, yes, the, the fibers that radiate out at the edge should be spread beyond the resist and they should be tucked under. Um, OK, I'm just looking to see some of these other ones. Um, <laughs> so so when you flip it over you then remove that top layer of bubble wrap so you're looking at your felt again so you just place the bubble wrap on top of your package and then you turn it over and then you remove the bubble wrap so you keep putting it back and forwards um jan I, I like to wet my fiber. I like to put a felting net on top of it and add my soap through the net. If you look at my wet felting tutorial, you will see exactly how I do that. But you can also um, just use soapy water when you're adding the water, but I prefer to use a net and, um, and soap it. And Jean, you seal the edges of the piece after you've cut it by putting your hand inside and then just rubbing gently on the cut edge. Um, 
So I put my hand in and I would just rub the cut edge with my fingertips like that. And I would just work it until I couldn't peel the fibers apart because when you cut it, you can actually see all the different layers, the three layers of fiber. So I would put my hands in and with my fingers, I would just work at that until it came together. As I say, I will put a, um, a tutorial up online in another few weeks. And for important pieces, yes, Esther, I do weigh the amount of wool per side. And I make sure that I have the same amount of wool on each layer and on each side of the ba bag. So um, I'm going to just keep, I'm going to continue now with this, um, the laying out of the, um, the piece. And I see that Brigitte has a question. And so her question is about when you are rolling up the piece of felt. So you can see here, I'm rolling the bag. I haven't used a pipe for this, but Brigitte is asking, can she use a wooden pipe or a wooden dowel? Yes, you can, Brigitte. You just need to make sure that the pipe is a little bit longer than the, the bag, you know, so that it sticks out at either end a little bit. and you need to make sure that it is going to fit into your pot. So if you're going to use um, a wooden dowel or a copper pipe, or you're going to use um, a metal pipe of any description, you need to make sure that it's going to fit into your pot. Now, if you look under my hands here, can you see there's something green? So what I decided to do with this particular piece was I also put a leaf or two underneath my string when I was going to tie this bundle up. So that's a good tip for you. If you have leaves that print well, of course you can use them. But sometimes I like putting a leaf, this particular leaf had a lot of nibbles out of it. This, this particular tree, the leaves don't always print very well, but if I put this under my tie marks and I have very um, dark liquid in my pot, which I did, I will actually get an interesting shape from the leaf anyway. So this is just a little tip. You can do this with all of your eco printing. Just add something like a leaf or um, a few twigs or a little bit of bark underneath your string and that will add interest to your um, where the tie mark areas are. So once you have your piece rolled up and tied really tightly, you need to cut a piece of string that's approximately from the knot up to your shoulder. I mean, this isn't essential, but I find this extremely helpful. And I'm trying to give you just ways of, um, ways of saving yourself time and also heartache in the studio. Because by having a length of string approximately this length, I can tie that to the outside of my saucepan to the handle. And then I can make a note of all these pieces um, that are going into the pot. And what then happens is that I can work out which piece needs to come out at which time. And I have all them tied onto the outside of the pot. Um, so I just see a couple more questions coming in. Yes, Wendy, tool is the same as net, except it, well, it's not the same, but if you have tool, you can use it. I don't like using it because the wool fiber sticks to it. I use a bit of a sort of a plasticated net curtain, an old net curtain. And Nicola is saying here, thank you very much, Nicola, that she highly recommends a tutorial about the making of the two bracelets. And that's actually a really good point, Nicola, because for those of you who have not worked around a resist before, if you got some resist material and you made some bracelets for yourself, you would learn the technique without doing anything complicated to start with. So in fact, that would be a really good um, thing to start with. And that tutorial is already up on YouTube, but I promise to do one with a vessel. So, um, Okay, so here's another question. I'm just answering some of these as we go along. So I hope you don't think I'm chopping around too much. But when you cut the top, the opening, no, you do not put more fiber. You only just seal the edges of that fiber. 
Okay, Claire has a really interesting uh, point here. So I'm going to have to go backwards now, Claire. So Claire is asking, once you've laid out the onion skins on the top side, how do you get the design on the other side of the bag? So if you look between this image here and the next one, can you see just where um, my left hand is touching? You can actually see the onion skins there in the middle. So it's a little bit like if you were if you laid jam on a slice of bread and you rolled up the slice of bread, what would happen is the jam would actually stick on the other side as well. So let's just say here's my envelope and we'll say that um, the writing here, that's actually an electrical bill, <laughs> say that the writing here is, is my vegetation and I've got no, no vegetation on that side. So this is my felt. These are my leaves. So as I roll, can you see how the leaves on this side are going to actually touch the other side of the felt? So what actually happens is the vegetation that I have added on the top here is also going to print on the other side. And then the curve um, where my hand is there, um, that curve is going to be obvious in the finished piece where the tie marks are. I can't explain it very much. Um, I can't explain it much better than that. You'll see the end result in a few minutes. And uh, Brigitte is now saying, perhaps the colors of the print will be so beautiful if she used a wooden pipe. No, Brigitte, they will be very beautiful and dark if you use a cast iron pipe. And they will be more golden if you use a copper pipe. But in my experience, the wood affects them very little. Um, there is tannin in the wood, but you will get much better prints if you use a metal pipe rather than a wooden pipe. Uh, if you're working in the dirty pot. Now, I'm going to actually post a comment uh, myself. I'm just um, putting a link to my eco printing in the dirty pot ebook. I've just put that into the chat and it is also linked in the video description. I'm not trying to push people to buy the book, but certainly you will get a lot of knowledge, the total foundations of eco printing without traditional powdered mordants. And I go through the different pipes and there are all sorts of stripped back nuggets of information in that book which will really really help you for the future and so I do think that many people who already have the book are getting wonderful eco prints so I've just put that link into the um chat there so um yeah that that's what I would would suggest if you haven't got the book and you're interested in you know really getting to grips with it as a process um so, Diane, I'm not sure if it was a bag, if it's a sculptural piece, a three-dimensional piece, why you wouldn't want the prints on both sides. But if you didn't, yes, baking paper would help to prevent the vegetation printing on that other side as well. So it would, although if it was a three-dimensional piece, it's not the same as... Um, as oh, I don't have a mug here. If you think if you have a mug... It would look very strange to have prints on one half of the mug and not on the other because you're making it three dimensional afterwards. So I think it's much better with three dimensional felt to have prints on both sides. But certainly, yes, if you used baking paper, that would um, that that would um, prevent the design coming through. Lexi, thank you so much. <laughs> the book is worth it. Thanks very much. <laughs> and here's another one. Book is very worth it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Monica. So this is fantastic. Thank you so much, um, all of you, for your very kind comments. And uh, Maria is absolutely right. The rolling is like a Swiss roll. So if you think you put jam on top of a piece of bread or cake and you roll it up, that jam is going to also get on the underneath as you roll it up. So um, thank you so much, all of these comments. And um, Brigitte, great. So I'm glad you get that bit. I'm going to go back and share more of these images. So I'm rolling the piece up. I've tied it really tightly. And then I am cutting that, that length of string to the length of my shoulder. Now, the reason I don't cut it longer is if you have too much string tied to the handle of your pot and it dangles down and you're working on gas, it might catch fire. 
but equally it can actually um the water can come up that string and it can drip down and it might even put your fire out um lori thank you very much um that's really kind of you and jan has an excellent question here can you use rusty tin cans yes they are fantastic but if you are doing a piece like a bag jan you may not have a large enough can you want to have any pipe or dowel or can that you roll your piece up on it really needs to be a little bit wider than what you're rolling up not narrower otherwise you can't make good contact and the rest of your piece will not um have um good prints um so i do see one or two questions coming in about eucalyptus and about leaves so and placement of things so i am going to answer those in a few minutes i want to keep going with some of these images just so you can see the whole process and so here what I'm doing is I put my two felt cords that I was going to use for the handles. I just sort of scrunched them up and I put some onion skins around them and I tied them really tightly together. So I wanted to print the onion skins and the for the or the onion skin wrapped bag and the cords that were going to be the handle. I wanted them to go into the pot at the same time because I wanted them to have similar tones and color. So if they don't go into the pot at the same time, they're not going to have the same colors. Now, that, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but I do like to have a little bit of relationship between things. So for me, I would always print the handles at the same time as the, um, the bag. So the next thing I'm going to share with you is the opening of this. And um, because I used onion skins and it was for a workshop, I used, um, I made a new pot liquid. I put uh, in the pot, like I described on day one or explained on day one, I had an aluminium saucepan. I half filled it with water. I added approximately 600 um, milliliters of vinegar. So that's just over a pint of vinegar. I put in a big chunk of rusty metal. I boiled it for approximately an hour. I added some eucalyptus leaves and I put in the, um, the bag and a few other pieces I was printing all at the same time. And I added some onion skins to the pot. And this next um, image, so this was the first time this specific new setup had been used, but you can still see how dirty those bundles look. There's a big bundle on the left-hand side, which I'm not sharing in this, but it will be shared in the membership platform. Um, so you can see there how dirty the outside of the bundles look. And um, I'm starting to unroll this here. And at this stage, you might be saying to yourself, oh, oh this is gonna be really dark everywhere, but look what happens. So it's not, the felt itself is quite white, there are beautiful golden or um, brown rusty prints from the onion skin. So the bit that's dark is the bit that's on the outside of the bundle and under the string. And there it is. You can see then that curve. Um, so this is one side. That's the other side of it. The curve there echoes the curve at the top of the bag. And that's because of how it's rolled up. I could equally have rolled that bag from the, um, instead of rolling it from the, hang on one second. Let's just say this was my bag. Instead of rolling it from the bottom up to the top, which is what I did, I could have rolled it from side to side. And in that way, I would have got the stripe marks in a different position. But it becomes more obvious when you've done it once or twice. And that's not something that I'm really going to talk about now. Um, but it, it becomes more obvious. So there is my bag and my cords. And at this stage, then, this piece needs to get a really, really good wash, exactly the same as if it was any other piece of felt or any other piece of eco printing. It needs a really good wash until the water runs clear. And then what I do is I reshape it. I make it three dimensional. 
I cut two little holes and I insert the that end of the handle into the little hole holes and I just tied a knot in this case and here is the finished bag now you can see here it looks darker where the dark pot liquid was but after it's been washed and ironed you can see it's more vibrant and you can also see the little knots that I, I where I attached those handles um, so that tutorial the full tutorial from start to finish there is a whole series of videos on that tutorial i am actually going to add that into the new membership platform just for people who join just to enjoy early on at the beginning um so now i'm going to just go and have a look at a few of your questions now and let's just see so okay so we have a question uh, hi from the uk how did you achieve the red color on the sculpture and I am thinking that you are talking about these red leaves here. So those leaves, it's just a specific variety of eucalyptus gives that color red print. And I cannot urge you enough when you are eco printing bags and vessels. Do not put too many leaves on your pieces. You need negative space as well as the print. So you need, in order for the prints to show off to the best of their ability, you need not to put too much vegetation. It's only really with experience that you start to learn what you will like very much, but that would be a tip for you. Don't put too much vegetation on, and it's just a question of having the correct source of leaves to get that color um and so again the, that's just you can see from the finished bag here that the um there isn't color everywhere and on the back of that bag the onion skins have just printed where they were in direct contact with the felt but there still is creamy white as well so again if you don't put too much vegetation down you see more of the creamy white felt and in turn it emphasizes the printing more and um so yes how do you determine the placing um so it is important to learn about the placing of vegetation but that's just something that you learn with practice. Here is that um, garment that I shared with you yesterday. So can you see the long lines down from the shoulder to the, um, to the hemline? That was folded over. And where the string mark is, where those tie lines are, that's where the string was. So this dress was placed with the side that you're looking at now was down on the table. I put leaves in the center of the dress. I folded those two edges in and then I rolled it up. I also put leaves on the second side. Uh, it's a little bit complicated to explain, but that's something obviously that I, I would teach in workshops and you know, with, with the um, membership program again, that will, will be in that. So I'm just gonna scroll down and see now, are there more questions that I can answer for you? Uh, excellent question here. Is there a difference between printing with fresh eucalyptus leaves and dried? Um, they all print really well if it's a variety of eucalyptus that prints well. And the fresh ones are soft and flexible. The dried ones, you need to soak them in warm water first to make them pliable. And I don't know. They're, it depends. It depends. I would say they print equally well, whether they're, they're, they're fresh or dry. However, after heavy rain, one of my eucalyptus varieties, it's called um, archery. It gives different color prints after heavy rain. So I suspect it would give a different print after it's dried. But the other varieties that I have, ha I have don't seem to have, you know, make any difference whether they're fresh or they're dry. Um, so another question that people often ask me, and you are quite, um, this is a question I often get asked, um, Kirsty. Um, so do I ever put something in the center of the vessel during the printing process? So I'm I'm thinking you mean something. Um, I'm thinking you mean something to make the shape. And the answer is no, um, definitely not. 
However, you can also put leaves into the center of your piece. And often I will do that with the like of a bag. And sometimes I might prefer the inside more than the outside afterwards, then I can turn it inside out. But I don't shape the piece into a three-dimensional shape. It's always flat when I am rolling it up to eco print. Um, so here's a question about, does the piece get darker where it touches the pipe? So it, it gets modified where it touches the pipe. So if the pipe is cast iron, it gets darker. If the pipe is copper, it goes more golden. If the pipe is galvanized steel, often it goes a sharper yellow, which can be really interesting. And if it's timber, it might go a duller color if it's wood. So yes, there is a modification effect from whatever pipe you use. And that's something that I do share images and talk about in the book as well, because you need to really see the images to see the sort of modification can, uh, that can occur and uh, yeah absolutely one of the reasons I particularly love sculptural felt is when I started to felt at the end of 2007 never in a million years did I think I would ever sew and so to me working around a resist and and making something sculptural with no sewing whoo it was just absolutely fantastic so um you know this dress here that's totally made around a template and uh, no sewing involved whatsoever. So yeah, I like that. <laughs> um, so, okay, now this is really, uh, Veronica, I think it's actually shocking that somebody in university would tell you that you didn't have um, a hand for felting. Um, absolutely try it again. And the very best tip I can give anybody, if, if if you are very gentle at the beginning, you, you will be able to felt, felt successfully. But if you try and work the fibers too quickly at the beginning, they don't come together. So absolutely everybody, I wish I had you in front of me, Veronica, because I, I'm quite confident that within a couple of hours, you would have made a beautiful piece of felt, guaranteed. So if you think these are the wool fibers and they're going to come together, you have one layer this way and one layer this way it's not the easiest to show you what many people do who find felting more difficult they rub too hard on the top so the fibers are going like this and they can't sort of tangle together whereas if you're gentle at the beginning the fibers start to tangle together and then as they come together you can become more aggressive so veronica watch my step-by-step -step wet felting tutorial the new one that's done in color it was only posted a couple of weeks ago. Watch that tutorial, follow what I do, and I guarantee you will make a very beautiful piece of felt. And I would really love you to uh, send me a picture of it afterwards, please. But I absolutely know you will make a beautiful piece of felt. Okay, so I'm just going down here. Okay, so the 3D shape of vessels. Let me bring a vessel back. Uh, add to okay, so the 3D shape is, is achieved by just sticking my hand into the felt by, um, okay, so I'll put my hand in. Okay, maybe I'll do it with this hand. So I'll stick my hand in. So I've got the vessel over my hand and I'll start going like this and I'll swirling it around. I'll put it flat on the table. I'll roll it. I'll put my hand in and I'll pull it a little bit like, um, clay not that I'm good at working with clay and then I'll put my hand in again or I'll put something like um I have some wooden tools I'll put them in and I'll get a wooden spoon on the outside and I'll go like that so it's just a question of work 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 until the shape is how I want it to be and the more I shrink it and stretch it and shrink it and stretch it it will hold that shape beautifully afterwards and I do think, I'll just add it back in again, I do really think that simpler shapes, don't make your shapes complicated. This was just a circle. If you're going to eco print, try and stick to a simple shape so that you can show off the eco prints to the best of their ability. There's no need to do something complicated. 
Um, okay, so I'm coming along to the next question. And please keep dropping questions in if you have them. And I'm going to just keep whipping down through them. So I did that particular bag was two and a half hours, Deirdre, from start to finish. It was boiling for two and a half hours in the dirty pot. Um, do you ever put felt or string inside your handles? The handles were just made. Um, I have a felt cord tutorial uh, on YouTube and the handles are just one very, very, very strong piece of felt with nothing in the middle. So no, but sometimes I, I make bags with integrated shoulder straps. And again, that will be in the membership platform. And also I love sewing on. Well, I don't love the sewing bit, but I love the effect of incorporating leather handles with my felt. I think leather and felt is brilliant. Uh, I've used wooden handle, um, etc. So um, I haven't put anything in the in the center of my cords. Um, so Nini, the pipe can be as wide a diameter as as you like. So the wider the pipe, the diameter of your pipe the more it will make contact with your felt so the bigger the modification of color so you really need to choose your pipe according to the size of your pot and what you're rolling up on and i can't say any more than that you just practicing and experimentation you're going to find out what what suits you um best so pam another good question i would felt my pieces fully you can still shape them after printing, but if you do too much shaping after printing uh, and shrinking, you're going to lose the clarity of your prints. So if your intention is to have good crisp prints afterwards, I would have your piece felted 99 or 100% before you eco print. And I would, if I go back um, to, one second now, I want to find the image, if I can find it, the image that I thought I didn't have, yeah. OK, so if I go back to this image here, you can see that the bag, I was shaping it on the table before I then soaked it and flattened it and actually rolled it up for the eco printing. So I would always shape my pieces before I would eco print them and then I would flatten them again. It's like there's the memory of that and the felt, it's much easier to shape afterwards. Um, Yes, you can make a pocket in the bag and um, there are different ways of doing it. Um, it's not gonna be the easiest to explain it here. So I'm just gonna do this really briefly, um, Susan, um, but it is something that, you know, on a future occasion I might show people. So let's just say, let's say this is my plastic template here right at the beginning you've got if you're working from the inside out if, if the final layers of your bag are going to be the outside of your bag you need the pocket to be on the inside so what you would do is you would lay your three layers of pocket here uh, on your template and then you would put another template on top of it but you would need to have the fibers from the pocket going out around the edge then you continue and you lay your full bag so it's not very easy because it's all a mirror image when I'm recording here. Um, so basically you would lay your pocket first with fibers going right out. Then you'd put a resist on top of the pocket and then you would lay the full bag out. And at the end, then that pocket will be on the inside of the bag. Okay, so that's the easiest way of doing it. Um, so interestingly enough, um, not quite sure how to pronounce your name, but I'm going to go for Chemissimo. Um, the liquid in the dirty pot really doesn't appear to get um, affected by the leaves because the leaves are inside the felt bundle. I haven't noticed there being any issue with it, but I do only put eucalyptus and onion skin in the pot. So you are correct about that. That's my personal preference. And um, let's see here now. Um, Okay, so Monica, um, how long did it take me to felt that bag? Hmm. I mean, if you're going to make a felt bag and you're a beginner, you're going to have to allow yourself a minimum of one day to make the bag. 
if I was to make the bag, I would certainly comfortably be able to make the actual bag itself, the, the base of the bag, forgetting about the handles in a morning. But that's only because it wasn't a very big bag and it's because it was a very simple bag. So I would say as a beginner, you need one to two days to felt a bag. Um, Jan, if you're using a wide diameter pipe, you're still putting leaves under the pipe. So you still have beautiful prints underneath and the modification of color from that. Okay. Um, okay. So Wilma or Vilma, um, it's definitely possible to print on cotton without using traditional powdered mordants. What I do is I used rust water, which is a mordant, but it's homemade. It's just um, rusty metal and water. And I do a 40 second dip of the cotton in the rust water. It looks very dirty at that stage, lay the vegetation out, eco print. And then once it's washed afterwards, all that rusty water washes out. So if you go back to my YouTube channel, after you've finished watching this video, I have a previous boot camp, and day three of the other boot camp is exclusively about eco printing on cellulose fa fabric in the dirty pot, and you will actually see exactly how that's done. Um, the thing about shaping, so I, I'm not. Um, Hats are not my forte. I'm actually pretty okay at making felt berets. And there are a couple of styles of hats I find okay, but I'm, I'm not a good hat maker. My buddy Dawn Edwards puts me to shame all the time, I have to say. Um, so the thing about shaping the hat after printing, I mean, it's exactly the, the same as shaping it before printing. I would be using steam, I would be using hot water, and it's much more pliable when, when the hat is hot. So you could use steam from your iron, et cetera, and pull it. And I also use pliers when I'm, I'm felting things. Like I get very aggressive with my felt, so that's the only tip. I mean, felting it after printing or shaping after printing is the same as shaping before printing, just exactly the same way. And uh, Wendy, um, a year, year and a half. It depends how often you use it. Um, but I use mine for six, seven, eight months. And Claire, this is a good question. Um, Claire's question, have you ever cut your onions into a shape? Um, <laughs> yes and no. I don't, I, I sometimes snip the onions or I used to. Um, I have also sliced eucalyptus leaves into long, thin strips. But because I'm not interested in pretty shapes per se, no, I haven't cut them into a heart, but I know other people have done and it does work really well. And something that can work extremely well and actually wonderful um, felt maker and eco printer, wonderful artist, Pam de Groot in Australia. Um, she, um, many years ago, she punched holes out of leaves with her, her leaf punch or with her with a hole punch and then the leaves had little holes in them but you can also use the round um, bits that you punch out and make a design but personally I like the natural beauty of the leaves so I don't tend to cut things out I prefer a more organic shape um welcome Alice delighted you just made it um okay so Janet um the colors providing you follow the method that I share in, you know, in my videos and, and the Dirty Pot ebook, and you use the correct vegetation that gives you color that's going to last. I haven't had things wash out whatsoever, and I wash all my own clothes in the washing machine. And I do have a tunic, a wool tunic printed with onion skins. It's about six years old now. And it gets multiple washes every year in the washing machine and it hasn't faded one little bit since the beginning however if you use vegetation that's not going to last um if you get inspired as many people do when you use things like flowers and you're not using um the traditional powdered mordants you're not going to get colors that last so in my book i recommend leaves that um i have found stand the test of time and they would include rose 
blackberry leaf, onion skins, cotinus or smoke bush, they all stand the test of time. Now, um, let me just see. On your round vessel is the thin. I, I'm not sure that I quite understand this. On your round vessel is the, between the leaf directions line. Hmm. Everything is done at the same time, but I'm, I'm afraid I don't fully understand that question. I'm sorry if there's another way of asking it or you can write it again afterwards. I'm not 100% sure about that question. Um, okay. So you're thinking of, okay, so this is um, in the membership. I'm going to be going through so many different things uh, tomorrow. Yeah. So, so some people may not know what the membership is. And I also don't want anybody to feel obligated to join me for the rest of the week. So tomorrow I'm launching a really exciting new membership program. And what that is, is it's an opportunity. If you'd really like to achieve the results you've always wanted with my help, I'm going to be cutting to the chase and I'm offering a membership. There's either an annual subscription or a monthly fee. There's going to be a library of content, which will build over the first few months, a library of content and then twice monthly private um trainings question and answer sessions then we'll be having all sorts of different um oh challenges and different things and a private facebook group so it's really it's it's my way of helping you achieve what you would like even if you live in a different part of the world so there's going to be loads about surface texture um nuno felt about achieving all sorts of different things and that particular necklace that that you saw on day one that particular necklace was a technique called um up wolfing and i can certainly share that on the membership um in, within the membership the thing about the membership as well that i'm launching tomorrow this is my first time offering it so i have a whole series of foundation and um, videos etc and tutorials and things that will be available to members and they will be released over the first few weeks i'll explain more about that tomorrow but then the members themselves will have the opportunity we will all have the opportunity together to forge the direction in which we go from there so for example we might decide that we're going to do plenty with tannin and iron one month or maybe it could be all about surface texture one month or adding things like glass into your felt or inclusions or bumps or all sorts of things but i'll explain more about that tomorrow about the direction how i see that going now we've already been on for over an hour so i'm just going to go back and i'm just going to see are there any questions that i have missed or do any of you have any other questions you would like to ask me now because this is your time and by the way, if you have actually uh, been getting value out of the video, please consider subscribing to my YouTube channel and uh, hit the bell to get notifications. And I have a Facebook group, which is all about wet felting and eco printing in the dirty pot. And so it would be really fantastic if you would like to join me there. Just answer the um, the membership questions. Um, it's just two questions to say you'll abide by the ethos of the group. But if you answer those, I will accept you into the group and it would be lovely to see you there and you can share your work. So have we got any more comments? I'm just going to scroll down and just see because otherwise... Okay, so <laughs> Tammy, I don't want to miss it either. <laughs> Same time tomorrow, Tammy. So... Every night at six o'clock this week, I will be live streaming and I'm very happy to continue to answer questions tomorrow about the boot camp. Well, tomorrow is really about the membership launch, but I will continue to answer questions about what we've covered during this boot camp. So um, do please tune back in if you have more questions. And so um, at six o'clock GMT tomorrow, Tammy, bring a glass of wine or a cup of coffee because I might say cheers once the whole thing goes live. And um, so let's just see here. Uh, so the next question here. Um, 
Okay, so Mary, the thing about the membership is it's going to be an ongoing membership. So you have the option of paying an annual subscription or of paying um, a monthly fee. So if you choose to leave after three months, well, then obviously you don't have access to the information after that. But for as long as you stick with the program, you have access to everything in the library. And the other thing is that for those people who choose to have their faith in me and uh, join as a founding member, um, it's opening tomorrow and it's closing at one minute before midnight GMT on Sunday. If you choose to join, you are going to be locked in at that price. And by that, it's 50% less than it's going to be offered the next time I offer it. And the reason for that is I want to build the whole program with you. I want to make sure I'm including what everybody will enjoy. And you will be helping me by giving me feedback. So you will get it forever at that price. Whereas when I release it the next time, which will be in approximately five to six months, there won't be any intake until the next release. At that stage, it would be 99 per month. So anybody who jumps in early, has their faith in me, uh, has enjoyed maybe the boot camp or been with me before, this is a great chance to have a good value membership with me. So that's the answer to that one. Um, so... Um, Claire, it, it really, it depends. You can boil them in just water and vinegar, um, but I still like having some rusty metal in the pot because that helps make the, the prints better. So it really depends what you want. Um, you could also turn your bag inside out, put the leaves on the inside, print it, and then turn it back out, and the inside will be paler than the outside afterwards. Um, so... Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Tammy. And um, yeah, I would say great news, Laura, because I think I froze some cotinus leaves before and it was at least two years and I used mine. They had decomposed a bit when I defrosted them. They were they were kind of falling apart. But oh, my goodness, the prints was spe were spectacular. So I would just say go for it. Uh, Pam, see you tomorrow, hopefully. Uh, Claire, thank you. I have to say I am really, really excited about the membership because I love teaching and this is a way of people implementing knowledge and a way I can help you get the results you want quickly. And there will be people who are total beginners and people who have much more experience, but I think it's going to be suitable for everybody and it's what I like doing and I like sharing. So <laughs> Yeah, um, absolutely, Tammy. I can tell you, I could have had wine this morning at 10 a.m., but there was none in the house. <laughs> so my neighbor has left a bottle on my doorstep for me for tomorrow. Uh, how many pages in the book, Jean? It's something like um, uh, something like around 70. Um, let me, yeah, I, I, around about 70. Um, you're very welcome, Inez. Um, so... Okay, so Nini, this, this is, so you are saying you get clearer prints if you put Ponger silk on top of the wool. So what I would suggest you do is that you wrap the Ponger, you wrap your template with Ponger silk, then you lay out your three layers of wool fiber, you felt your piece, and then afterwards you turn that vessel inside out and you will have Ponger silk on the outside of the vessel. But that does not mean it's a Nuno felt vessel. Nuno felt is one layer of fabric with a very fine layer of fiber. And you would need a stiffener if you wanted that to actually um, hold up. It wouldn't, you couldn't make it sculptural, a piece of Nuno felt, unless you were using something artificial to make it stiff. So you can certainly have three layers of wool and a layer of Ponger silk, no problem at all. Um, Claire yeah I'll, I, I don't want to think that I'll be making alcoholics of people so please don't think I'm trying to encourage everybody to drink <laughs> um yeah okay so um the prints it, you would be soaking things in yeah the cotton in cow or soy milk a, a soy milk dip and a dry and a dip and a dry four times is much more efficient than doing it once and again 
plenty of cellulose um, information will be happening all in the membership. And I'm not trying to push people to the membership, but of course I would love if some of you you um, join. Um, <laughs> okay, do you ever use a round ball resist? Twice I tried and I failed absolutely catastrophically. Impossible, even with experience, even when I was felting about five years, I thought, hmm, Beth Bede, I hope that's how you pronounce her name, that very well-known American felt maker, she felt it on this ball to make a vessel. So back I went to try and do it again. No, didn't work at all for me. So very definitely no. And um, in relation, Maria, to translation, um, I'm hoping once the YouTube videos are optimized afterwards and I have a little time to just get myself organized, I will add subtitles to the videos and I will add them in different languages. But it's just not something I don't have enough hours in the day right this minute because I'm also help care for my mother. Um, she has Alzheimer's and another relative with dementia. So I'm afraid I don't have enough hours in the day to translate right at this minute. Um, so not uh, so I haven't I've used lichen and it was a catastrophe um, in relation to printing. I have done some beautiful natural dyeing with mushrooms and I haven't combined that yet with eco printing. I have a good friend called Anne Charlotte Fonselius who lives in Sweden. She's just the most magical um, natural dyer with an encyclopedic knowledge of mushroom dyeing. And I really, really hope I can go to Sweden in the winter and or the autumn winter and uh, maybe collect some mushrooms with her and just see how she gathers them and learn to identify them. But mushroom dyeing and combining it with eco printing is something I'm really interested in. I have one silk top that I eco printed and then I over dyed with mushroom dyes and it, it's divine. It's absolutely wonderful. Um, Okay, so yeah, Lexi is saying that eucalyptus leaves will dried will hold up in the fridge. Yeah, but there's not even any need to put them in the fridge. I have some for about seven years in in my neighbor's shed in the farmyard. They they really don't need to be in the fridge. Um, so I'm just going down through this. Um, okay, so Julie, um. <laughs> I'm Irish and we have brown bread. And so bread soda is probably, um, it's like bicarbonate of soda. It's something that you would use in cooking to make things rise. So if you look up bread soda, you might find it called baking powder or bicarbonate of soda. There's a slight difference, but I think it's baking powder. And yes, I only neutralize when I wrap around a rusty metal pipe. There's sufficient um, alkalinity in the soap when you wash your pieces out afterwards that if your piece has been in a pot with rusty metal, that's OK. It's only when it's in direct contact with the rusty metal you need to do the neutralizing. So um, thank you so much. I'm so excited about the membership and uh, delighted you've got the book. I really hope you enjoy it. Um, yeah, thanks, Alice. Um, yeah, well, I, and part of the problem with mum as well is she is, I, you know, we don't live together. It's just under two hours drive. And that was why I nearly missed my uh, live stream on, on Monday because we ended up, we got caught in a car wash for 45 minutes. I thought I wouldn't be back in time. So luckily I was. Um, okay, so let's see. Oh, this is <laughs> Esther. Every single year I am surprised about um things what I try and do is and what I try and encourage people to do is strip it back to the basics there's so much information online but unless you have got the very basics you can't move forward because you don't know how you got things you don't know how you arrived there so I start at the basics and then every year I try adding in one or two different types of leaves from the garden or or from the hedges and many of them give no prints. And then suddenly I'll find one that gives a print. And so it's really exciting identifying new leaves that print. Um, yeah, hands are pretty full, Lexi, but I love doing this. So this is really great. Thank you all so much. Thanks for all these lovely comments. Baking soda. Thank you, Leslie. Baking soda. Um, 
Yeah, no, uh, Carrie, I don't think it's too late or too early to drink at 4.30, Carrie, at all. So please get your glasses ready and we'll raise we'll raise a glass tomorrow night. Absolutely. Um, not powder. Okay. Call it soda bread in the US. Yeah, yeah. Well, if you come to Ireland, Alice, you're welcome to come here and I'll make you, I'll bake you some bread here. Um, 4.30 a.m. Well, then it's definitely not too early. It's just you're late, Carrie. Yep, yep. <laughs> now I'm really laughing on an inflatable swimming pool. <laughs> I mean, some people are able to do it, but I'm just not able to do it myself. A curra would have been absolutely beautiful. Um, yeah, <laughs> I'm really laughing. Um, um no i i i haven't used moss at all in it and also um there are certain things that really you shouldn't be picking much of you know they are protected species so i don't pick moss for anything at all um so um brilliant i think those are all the questions and really thank you all so much for your lovely comments i'm really charmed by them and i hope you've enjoyed it and i would really like to say thank you so much as well to sock because sock is actually in the philippines and he's been fielding all your your questions for me and highlighting them so thank you so much everybody I look forward to seeing as many of you as choose to join me tomorrow. I'm happy to answer more questions tomorrow, but I will have loads of information about the membership and it will open for registration tomorrow. So thank you again and over and out from Clashine.